Hi, and welcome to Bible Study with Friends. I'm here with my friend, Philip Thomas. We are continuing on our Bible study, and we're almost finished with our Bible study in 1 Timothy. Uh, this is an interesting set of verses today. We're only going to cover two verses, and we will be talking about Christian slaves in the context of then and the context of now. I believe there are Christian slaves today, and there are Christian uh, principles that we need to apply to our culture today in the same way that Paul is addressing young Pastor Timothy to address in his culture of the first century. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. <music> Welcome back. How are you doing, Philip? I'm doing pretty good. I'm excited about these two verses because uh, I think we've got a really timely subject that is really not only timely, but it is it is really germane to our situation today in America uh, and really around the world. I'm not just picking on America here, but around the world. And we're going to be talking about that as we go into this today. But we're only going to be covering these two verses, verses one and two of this section, because now what, what's happened is it relate up to this verse. We covered this last week. Remember it, the, the fourth charge of Paul to Timothy. And he said I, in verse 21 of chapter five, he says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the, of the chosen angels to maintain these principles. Now, he's not just talking about the principles in the verse right before or whatever. He's talking about the principles of sound doctrine that are in the book of 1 Timothy. Okay. And he's saying, I want you to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. And then he moves on on how to deal with sinners in the church and in the, in the context of that, hey, Pastor Timothy, don't do anything in a spirit of partiality or favoritism in a principle of one group is better than another group. We talked about that a little bit last week, but that's the context of what he's talking about. Now, he's, he's breaking these up into little pieces. He's going to talk about, he just talked in chapter five about uh, don't in a matter of partiality, don't treat sinners in the church a special way because they are different people. And now he's going to talk about slaves. And we have to know that the culture of Ephesus and the culture of the first century, remember, 1 Timothy is written in uh, about 62 to 64 AD. So only about 30 years after Christ's death and resurrection. And in that first century culture, this is a culture dominated by Rome. Uh, Nero was the emperor up to about 64, 65 AD. He dies. Um, and, uh, and before he dies, he kills Paul. So I assume this letter is written before uh, 64 AD. But it's, it's a, a letter that Paul is writing in the context of, of a very racist culture. Now, Philip, how did, if you think about the first century culture, what would be the basis of racism in that culture that you can think of? Uh, what would be some of the, in the first century church, especially the first half of the first century uh, under Roman domineering, under under uh, Nero, what would be some of the basis for racism, or or partiality, or or favoritism in the culture that you can think of? I mean, I think about the Gentiles. Okay, like... now that was interesting because that was a Jewish racism deal. That it was us Jews and everybody else are Gentiles, and we are superior because of everybody else. So that that was kind of a, that was a religious 
yeah. racism uh, based upon us and the rest of them, right? Yeah. And we are better than the rest of you all. Okay. So there was a spiritual racism. Now that spiritual racism wasn't just with the Jews. Uh, the Greeks on a spiritual level or a philosophical level felt that they were superior to everybody else. They were philosophically, intellectually superior. Okay. And the Romans felt they were not only politically superior, but also economically superior. Remember, if you were a Roman citizen, you had rights that were superior rights to anybody else in the empire. Okay. So we see... We see uh, religious racism, religious um, partiality. We see economic. We see the, this idea of being a citizen and having rights as a citizen that not everybody had. And if you didn't have those rights as a citizen, you were inferior. That sounds very familiar to, to immigrants today who may feel that kind of racism that uh, an American citizen might have partiality towards an immigrant who does not have that citizenship. That sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the idea of political racism, of saying, uh, I am of Rome, yeah. or I am of Greece, and therefore I have this, I have this intellectual racism, intellectual racism. Um, partiality and favoritism. Now, there was also economic racism because there were pe poor people that basically sold themselves into slavery. They couldn't pay bills or they, or they, they couldn't survive. So they basically sold themselves as indentured servants, the way the, the, the colonies did back in the in the 15 or 1600s in America. They were indentured servants and they served for a while and they made money as slaves, but they were indentured or they were s slaves because of economic pressures. Now that sounds familiar to a lot of our, our cultural problems today in America. We have, we have the upper class, middle class and lower classes, uh, and we have people in each of those that feels either inferior or superior. Does that ring true to you? Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Okay. Yeah. So culturally, we in America should pay attention to these verses because we in America face the same kind of culture of partiality and racism that Timothy was addressing with the help of Elder Paul. And this is flat out strong uh, advice to Pastor Paul. Now, in the church in Ephesus, we know that Ephesus in, in, the, in the 60s uh, AD was full of slaves. It was a very prosperous town. It was a Roman town. It was a Greek town. There was a lot of different nationalities there, a lot of different merchants. And Every one of those races had slaves. We know from the culture, Romans had slaves, Greeks had slaves, Jews had slaves, and we know there were minorities based upon race, religion. I remember, the, do you remember the Samaritans? Yeah. How the Jews looked down on the Samaritans because they were half-breeds. They were a mix of Jewish and Gentile blood. And they looked down at them. They were they were snobs. And when Jesus talks to them and and ministers to a, a Samaritan woman, she goes, "Man, what are you doing talking to a Samaritan?" And even the apostles felt that way. But Jesus leads the way with a very non-partial, non-racist approach to the gospel of those people. And as as we as Christians face our culture today, a culture of racism and partiality and unfairness. We can take these principles of racism and partiality and economic, political 
citizenship unfairness. And we can apply these principles of how are we supposed to act? Now, I also want to talk about there's two aspects of this slavery for today. Okay. One is slavery. Okay. And we can talk about that. That may be debt. It may be social class. It may be racist, maybe whatever. But the other is economic in the sense of a, a master equaling a boss, someone who has, has submitted to a master as a means of economic survival. And that's an employer. So in another sense, we can apply these principles to employment. How are we as Christians supposed to handle working for somebody and depending upon somebody for our livelihood and for our survival and for our financial deal? That makes sense? Yeah. Now, all I'm doing here is, is putting this into a, a cultural framework that sure. applies to them then and us now. And what I'm talking about is Christian slaves now and Christian slaves then and the principles that apply to them. All right, let's go into let's go back to this, this verse. Let's let's read this and just see what it's talking about. Okay. Read, read verse one. All who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. All right, now, a question. Who is this verse addressed to? All who are under the yoke, so the slaves. All right, this verse is not addressed to slave owners, is it? No. Okay. It is clearly addressed to people under domination, people under, under the yoke of slavery, right? Yeah. People that were harnessed, people that were controlled. That's this idea of this, uh, all who are under the yoke, all who are controlled for various reasons as slaves. And then the command is they are to regard their own masters as worthy of honor, all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Now, this is addressed to slaves, and it is addressed to slaves about how they should treat their own masters. Now, this is not about slaves and how they should treat all men of a different race or all men of a different economic strata. This is talking about relationships of a slave to his particular master or an employee to his particular boss. That makes sense? Yeah. And uh, I think that's pretty clear, don't you? Yeah, I would, I would agree. Yeah. Okay. So he's talking to slaves about their relationship with their own masters. And they're basically saying the master is worthy of honor. Now that word honor is just, it, all it means is respect doesn't mean reverence. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means they are worthy of a certain amount of respect. Then it gives the explanation of why. And I'll read the rest of the verse from, they're worthy of honor. Why? To masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. So why do you honor your boss or your slave owner? Why? So so that the name of God will be honored and the doctrine will not be spoken against? Exactly. In other words, as a testimony of you being a Christian, you are giving honor, not even because they deserve it, but you're giving honor because you are giving honor in the context of being a Christian. And that way, our doctrine of being free in Christ and not being um, yoked to anybody except Christ, but his desire is for us to be a testimony to the people who culturally were yoked to. And so not to shame being the name of Christ or the doctrine of being free in Christ, but living in a culture that we have to live in. 
So does that make sense? Oh yeah. He's addressing he's addressing slaves, and he says we should respect we slaves should respect our masters. And notice it doesn't say Christian masters here. It just says we should respect our masters as a testimony, so that the 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 doctrine, so that the name of God, Christian, Christ follower. And the doctrine of being a Christian should not be spoken against. So you, if you've got a boss and he says, man, those Christian employees are just troublemakers. They waste time. They don't work hard. They're, you know, they're always talking about Jesus in the workplace and they don't work. Or, and I got some Christian employees and I trust them because these guys are serious about not stealing they're serious about putting in a good day's work. And they, they give glory to their Lord for that. You see the difference? Oh, yeah. And he's saying, we need to respect our bosses as slaves for the sake of the Christian gospel. Now, what that means is automatically he is telling slaves to put their relationship with Christ and their Christianity above being slaves do you think that's true there is is that what he's talking about wait can you say that again all right he, he's talking about priorities here and he says as a slave yeah. i need you to put your priority on being a christian and worrying about the christian testimony oh. more than being a slave yes yeah i would or, agree or being black, or being yellow, or being brown, or being white, because there were white slaves. It wasn't just a racist thing. But this idea would be, I'm asking you Christian slaves to put your concern about being a good testimony for the gospel of Christ above your rights or abuses as a slave. Okay. Do you see that there? Yes, I do I'm see try that. to put words in, in his mouth here, but I think that's what he's talking about. To to do that, to obey verse one, that's what you've got to do as a, as a Christian slave. You've got to say, it's more important to be a good Christian as a slave than it is to be a, a black person or a yellow person or a brown person or a white person in, in the context of the cultural slavery. Then in verse two, he says, those who have believers as their masters. Now, he's still talking to who? He's still talking to the slaves. He said, yeah. though. Yeah, he said, now, up here, you, masters are worthy of honor, respect. And he does not mitigate the word masters. It, all masters, your bosses and the people who are over you and who have literally enslaved you, they're worthy of respect for the sake of the gospel, right? So, so that the name of Christ will not be spoken against, or that our doctrine of liberty in Christ will not be spoken against. Those who have believers as their masters, notice this word right here, must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren. Now, how would that work, Philip? How would let's say you're you're a slave and you're a Christian slave and you know that your master is a Christian. We have examples of this in the first in the in the first century church where there are slaves and masters. In fact, in Ephesus, Pastor Paul or Pastor Timothy is going to have to deal with members of his church who are masters and members of his church who are slaves. And sometimes the spiritual leaders in the church are slaves. And they're ministering to, spiritually ministering to, masters who may even own them. <laughs> that means if you're a Christian slave and you, and you lead your master to Christ, you are your master's spiritual father, but he owns you. <laughs> wow. Right? Yeah. And this is a message to them. Now, he says, just because you're a believer and they're a believer, you should not act in a way that is disrespectful. That goes under 
you honor your, your master and you honor your boss, whether he's a Christian or not. And if he is a Christian, don't take advantage of that. Don't, yeah. don't be dis, do not be, and that's pretty strong language. This, this is not a suggestion. This is a command. Do not right. be dis, disrespectful to them because they are brethren. So don't take advantage of the fact that they're Christians and say, well, I can get away with stuff because he's a Christian and I'm a Christian. And that would apply to our, our workplace today. What happens if we have a Christian boss? Do we, do we take advantage of that? No. Do we want to be treated differently because we're Christians and they're Christians? Or do we put in a good day? Now, let's go back to this. And stop me if you want to discuss something more here, Philip, but... Those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. In other words, I should work even harder for a Christian boss or for a Christian owner because I'm benefiting, I'm serving him to benefit a brother in Christ. Mm. Now you see where Paul again puts the consideration for working as a slave or as an employee and saying, do it as a Christian and putting that consideration above the racism or the partiality or the economic reasons. He's really putting this context of Christian slavery and Christian, I think in Christian employment, that's where I've applied it in my life, above above that's more important how i relate to my boss as a christian whether he's a christian or not a christian if he's not a christian i need to do it as a testimony if he is a christian i need to do it as a brother in christ as a way to benefit him and benefiting him as a brother in christ and a beloved one of christ christ loves him and he loves me but i want to work hard for him because i am benefiting a brother Christian. And then he goes on and he says, teach, and this is another command, teach and preach these principles. And I think a lot of churches today do not preach and teach those principles. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. These are principles, not of just spiritual, but these are principles of how the spiritual considerations would affect our relationships in the culture our relationships in a racist culture, our relationships in a economically unfair culture, in a in relationships to a, a religiously biased culture. All of that fits. And the, the culture that Paul is telling Timothy to pastor in, there is no thing about you Christian employees should raise up and march on your employer's and demand your rights as Christians. Mm -hmm. You don't see any of that there. Now, I want to take some time, because those two verses by themselves just talk about, hey, slaves, for whatever reason you're a slave in your culture, consider your Christian faith as more important than other considerations. As a witness to non-Christian masters and bosses, and as a way of supporting and being a, a good worker for the sake of another Christian, for his benefit. Remember the verse in 1 Corinthians where it talks about if you have to treat others as more important than yourself. But yeah. if I've got a Christian boss, I need to work as if my Christian boss's benefit is more important than my own. And God will keep track. I'm not saying, you know, be a doormat. I'm saying... Have a reason for why you're doing what you're doing. I'm doing this for a non-Christian boss to, to win that non-Christian boss to Christ, to be a testimony to him. And I'm doing it for a Christian boss as an encouragement to him that as a Christian, I got his back. I'm praying for him. I'm working for him. I want him to succeed. Now, will that benefit us? I think so. It'll benefit us because God keeps track. But it'll also benefit what's the reaction of a Christian boss going to be? To a, to a strong Christian worker who he knows is a fellow Christian, his reaction is going to be beneficial to the slave, beneficial to the employee. Mm -hmm. Philip, I want us to, to spend just a little bit of time. I'm going to give you some verses 
because this is not an isolated teaching. I want us to look at some verses, and I'd like you to comment on these verses as, as we read them. And we'll do this very quickly, but let's look at let's look at some verses on this same subject. Look over at, at uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 9. Now, this is still Paul, and it's still Paul writing to young pastors who he has a relationship with. So in Titus chapter 2, verse 9, read, us, read what that says. Urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters and everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative. Now you see, see the concept there? Mm -hmm. Some things you notice about them is bond servants are, are slaves. Uh, the word, the word uh, bond servant there is, is doulos, and it, it basically just means slave. Okay, he, he basically says, don't be argumentative. Don't be, be a good slave. There's nothing in that that talks about being rebellious. There's nothing about that that talks about being there working for your freedom. I mean, right? Yeah, but, but when I think about slavery, isn't it like a different type of slavery, though, back in this time? It's not like, but I'm not thinking of like an American slavery, right? Like, that chattel slavery like i'm thinking of like you oh, said no, like, it was there, there were there were different kinds but one of the kinds of slavery was very much like the slavery of the south people yeah. were purchased and people were sold and people were absolutely controlled and the master if you if you read the book of philemon for example a master had had absolute control over the slave he could kill a slave without going to any kind of court, without getting anybody's permission, he could, he could kill a, a possession for any reason. Now, that sounds a lot like the slavery of the South to me. Yeah. Uh, so there were different kinds of slavery. There was this, this economic slavery, which was more like indentured servants. It was more like having an employee. Yeah. But there was an element of slavery in the culture and, and in the church, there would have been slaves from all of these different types. So we as Christians need to be careful not to say, well, biblical slavery is not the same slavery. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. It was based upon color. It was based upon race. It was, it was based upon religion. There was all kinds of basis for it, social, economic deal, citizenship. I mean, that sounds like our culture today, because I don't think racism today in America is a one faceted racism. I think we are, we're racist over religion, you know, conservative uh, and, and, and liberal we're mm -hmm. over religion. Uh, Methodists hate Lutherans or <laughs> what I'm saying, whatever it is. Yeah. Jews still do not like Gentiles and vice versa. There are Gentiles that think Jews are all Jesus killers, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in America, we have all kinds of different facets. We may have a different kind of racism towards an American Indian than we do towards a black person, but it's racism. Uh, it, it, you know, I'm married to a Chinese, and she experiences racism that might be slightly different than you as a black man experience, but it's racism. All right. And that is... We, we got to be careful not to say, well, biblical race, bi biblical slavery is not the same. Yeah, it really is the same. <laughs> a master could jail his slave. He could beat his slave. He could mistreat his slave on any basis. And he could even kill his slave with total permission from Rome, who was the government of the day. So there were a lot of similarities to racism of today, but also a lot of slaveries to the abuse of racism that we think at the height of chattel racism. Does that okay. make sense? Now, yeah. in light of that, th this, this is slavery. Read that verse again in Titus chapter 2, verse 9. Urge bond slaves to be subject to their masters and everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative. Now, he is addressing in the context of Titus, he's addressing slaves in the church. He's addressing Christian slaves. And there again, he's asking them, 
be respectful, don't be troublemakers, because you're placing your status as a Christian above your status as a slave. Hmm. It's more important to be a good, solid Christian who works as a slave than a slave who happens to be a Christian. Hmm. All right? Now, let's look at another verse. Let's look at another verse that Paul is writing. This is in Colossians. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 and read from 22 to 25 of Colossians 3. Slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartedly as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. Uh, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Okay. Now, so he's basically saying, again, that you see this, this idea of elevate your relationship with Christ above your status mm -hmm. as a slave or as a, you know, under a racist deal or an economic deal or whatever it may be. As a Christian, it's important to be a Christian first. Mm -hmm. And he's talking here in, in Colossians, he's talking to slaves again. He's addressing slaves and their owners are not necessarily Christians. They're not even necessarily good owners. But he says, do everything you do as a slave. And, and for us, do everything you do as an employee heartily because you're serving Christ as a slave. You're serving Christ as an employee. Do you see that there in that verse? Yeah. That's a huge verse. Uh, again, in the same context of Christian slaves need to put their Christianity and their faith and walking in their faith and working because of their faith above whatever status they're in. Now, I want us to look at another verse because he's going to address an interesting thing here. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, starting at verse 20. I've got you reading today. 1 Corinthians 7. 20 to 24. Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. Were you, were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, rather do that. For if he was called in the Lord while a slave, is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he, will also, likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. What's that saying? Yeah, it's just saying that if you were called as a Christian, then you should remain as that, like while you're even a slave. Okay. He sets up the scenario that if you are a non-Christian slave and you became a Christian, don't use your Christianity as an excuse to try to get out of being a slave, no, to rebel. Instead, if you were a Christian and you became a slave, stay a slave. Don't just work heartily. All these other verses that we've been talking about. If you have the opportunity to become free, let's say you have a Christian uh, master and he decides to set you free. Yeah. Take it. Paul says that clearly in that verse. Go ahead. You, you can do that. But don't rebel and don't agitate to try to get free and don't run away remember philemon and onesimus mm -hmm. onesimus runs away as a slave becomes a christian paul leads him to christ and what does paul do he sends him back to his master as a christian brother a christian master sends a philemon is an interesting book to read uh under those circumstances so we see here again if you're a Christian slave, don't use that as an excuse to be a troublemaker. If you're, if you become a Christian uh, before you're a slave, don't do things to put you into slavery. In other words, Christians should not. If you're a Christian and you're not a slave, you should be careful not to put yourself into indentured servitude. Don't sell yourself. And 
I know Christians that do that all the time. It's called debt. Yeah. <laughs> but the bank owns us, right? Yeah. And we can't we can't change jobs. We can't do other things because we ha- we don't have that freedom because we owe that money and we got to pay that money. Now, look at another verse. Let's look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. We got two more v- verses to read after this, and then we're then we're done. You said Galatians 3, 28? There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, he's not being an idiot here. He's not saying there's no such thing as race. That, I mean, you and I are brothers in Christ, but you are black and I am white. I mean, that right. to, to say, oh, it, it, there is no color. That's crazy. Yes, there is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And he's saying when he says there's neither Jew nor nor Gentile nor 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 slave nor Greek nor nor you know all these things, male nor female, this is radical comments because he's talking about putting our Christianity, our faith above those considerations. He's not saying those things don't exist, but he says as Christians, I can look at a at a, at a black brother. And say, hey, there, there's no, there's no partiality between us. Why? Because I'm putting my faith above my race, and you're putting your faith above your race. So as Christians, there's no race issue. You see? So yeah. as Christian slaves, we are to put this idea of I, I'm a Christian and I'm free in Christ, and I'll I'll work for a testimony of being a strong Christian employee or a strong Christian slave in the culture. That's an unfair culture. Okay. But I'll put my Christianity and the fact that God is paying attention and God will help me do this. I will put it ahead of all other considerations, male or female. I'm not going to put down somebody because he's a female or she's a female. (laughs) She's a female based upon that. No, I'm going to treat a female like a sister in Christ. I'm going to treat a male like a brother in Christ. Because being a Christian is what matters. Now, two more verses. Okay. But you see, these principles are pretty consistent. Paul's being very consistent. And he's making some very radical things that it doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter what political deal you are. It doesn't matter what religion you are. There's a religious background, heritage, Jew and Gentile doesn't matter your philosophy greek or roman right what matters is your faith and your faith should be above all those considerations now look at look at first peter this is a completely different this was these are all been paul writing now this is peter jesus best friend writing look at first peter chapter 2 and go to verse 13 i'm going to have you read 12 verses here real quick okay and you're going to see similarities between Two different church leaders. Uh, one was ministering to Gentiles and one was ministering to Jews. Um, okay. And this this is a message to us. Go ahead and read it from starting from verse 13, read to verse 25, but I'll stop you as we go. Okay. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right all right stop there why do we why do we submit to our government our kings and our governors and our our political um supervisors why do we do that what does that what does it say in 13 for the lord's sake for the lord's sake not because it's cool to do not because it's fun to do Not because it's easy to do, but we do it because we're Christians. And this is a way of having a testimony for the Lord's sake. That relates right back to what Paul was talking about. For the sake of the name of Christ, be a good servant, be a good slave, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, keep reading. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men. And do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond, bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, 
fear God, honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. Now you see that? He's saying, uh, in this context, he says, for the sake of being a Christian and a, a good testimony, all right, because you're saved, you're going to work as a good slave and not be a troublemaker. You're going to submit to them for the sake of, of the gospel, even if the master is not a nice guy. Do you see that verse you just read? Mm -hmm. So Peter is being, he's being realistic. He says, you're going to, you're going to be a slave of a master who's nasty, or you're going to, you're going to be under a president who's nasty or a governor who's nasty or a boss who's nasty, whatever it is. You're going to be under some nasty people, but for the sake of your testimony, you're going to do good, whether you're rewarded for doing good or not, God will reward you, but you're going to do good because you are a believer. So there again, we see this same principle. Peter is saying, put your faith in Christ and your Christianity and your Christian walk above the considerations of your rights, whether you're mistreated or not. Mm -hmm. And no matter what your race is, no matter what your religion is, your religious philosophy or heritage. Okay. Do you, do you see that it's saying that? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I, I see that. Okay. Now I want to finish real quickly with one. I'm going to stop you there. Let's go okay. over to this. This is a letter to the Ephesians. This is where Timothy is being a pastor, right? So it, it, we just got done talking about this is Paul's command to pastor Timothy in his church about masters uh, or about slaves being good uh, em employees or good servants for the Lord's sake, right? So that nobody can talk bad about the gospel. Now he's going to write to the Christians in the church of Ephesus. So this isn't to the pastor. This is to the congregation. And I want you to flip over to Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 5. Ephesians 6. Five, and we're going to go from five to nine, and we're going to stop. Okay. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters do the same things to, the, to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Okay. So here he addresses Christian slaves and Christian masters. Yeah. Okay. But we don't have to, he doesn't say, you Christian slaves do this if your Christian masters are are good. No, that's there. In fact, he did, and he talks to Christian masters, and he says, "Do this to your slaves, whether they're good slaves or not." Why? Because God's keeping track, and God will reward you, and and God will protect you, and God will bring about things in your life. So we we see some strong principles here to the church, and. The overriding principle, I think, here, Philip, and, and, and uh, agree with me or disagree with me, but I think the overriding principle that we've seen in all this discussion of, of masters and submitting to authorities and submitting to owners and submitting uh, that in light of our desire to be good, solid, God-glorifying Christians. You know, when he talks about whatever you do, do all to the glory of Christ. And that's, that's in the context of working as a slave. Yeah. So the, I think the overriding principle for us today, as it was for them then, mm -hmm. is that whatever culture we find ourselves, whatever the situation we find ourselves, whether we're working for a Christian, whether we're working for a non-Christian who's nasty, whether we, whether we're indentured because of our, our um, our economic structure or because of 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 social structure whatever it may be 
we should put our faith in Christ above those considerations and live glorifying to Christ, submitting to the situation we're in and let God work out the situation. He may let, he may let us be free. He may, he may let us continue to work glorifying him and being a, a strong witness as a Christian employee or as a Christian slave. But none of these verses anywhere have anything about rise up and take over and and demand your rights and punish your your masters that are not treating you right <clears throat> not once it does not exist in the in the the new testament or in the old testament for that matter remember uh, joseph's comment to his brothers who sold him as a slave flat out sold him back yeah. to the chattel of of the south right <laughs> they sold him and God, God worked out some amazing things over the course of a number of years. Yeah. But when he was a slave, he was a good, solid slave. And he did good for his masters. And sometimes he was rewarded. Sometimes it was not very fair what he got. But at the very end, he says to his brothers, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. And I think in our culture, there are people in our culture, absolutely people in our culture, who mean things against us for evil against us. Whether we're white or black or, or whatever, Jewish or whatever we are, there is somebody that means evil against us. Somebody, somewhere in this culture. Somebody who's mad at us politically or socially or racially or economically or whatever. And we should be aware that what God wants from us is in this culture now, the same as in that culture then, he wants us to be strong Christians who are working to give him glory and not being troublemakers hmm. with our masters, whether they're Christian masters or not. What do you think? I mean, I think about the Bible. I mean, there's things that are hard to digest, but... I mean, God gives us his word for a reason, so. And by that. faith, we go, man, I'm in a tough spot, and this is bad. But I am going to submit to the scripture, that sound doctrine that, that Timothy keeps writing to Paul about. Uh, I have decided to make the commitment to obey God, and I'm going to let him sort it out, right? Yes. And I'm going to have faith in him. No matter what, no matter how long it takes, no matter what the circumstances are, I'm going to submit to him. That's the same kind of surrender we get if we have a disease. We say, well, it's not fair, but I'm going to submit to Christ, and I'm going to let God work it out whether I'm cured or whether I'm not cured, whether I die. I'm going to die giving God glory. That makes sense? Yeah, it does. Christian slaves, for whatever reason, then and now, we need to put our faith and our walk with Christ and our obedience to God above all other considerations and be strong where we are in our culture. Nowhere does it talk about a slave trying to get out of his culture. It does say if, if you have an opportunity to, feel free. Go ahead. But don't force it. Instead, live as a good testimony. All right, bro. We're going we're gonna to stop there. Hey, listen, I hope you guys... We're blessed uh, in YouTube. This is a tough couple of verses, but, and this is a tough subject culturally in our day. It just is. And I'm not trying to sugarcoat anything, and I'm not trying to, to be biased or partial. I'm just trying to say, this is what God's word says. Deal with it. <laughs> because as Christians, that's what we need to do is deal with it. And we need to prayerfully deal with it. I'd love to hear your comments. Be kind in your comments. I don't want hateful comments. But I would like to hear your observations, the same as I invite Philip to give me his observations. I pray that the Lord will use these verses to bless you. And that next week, as we go into uh, the next few verses of 1 Timothy chapter 6, that you read ahead and that you pray about how these verses actually apply to your life today, as we've done in this discussion. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Thank you.